the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs, with your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. The closest he's ever come to climbing a mountain was on the side of a can of bush, beer. Oh, wait, no, that was me, Stu Horvath. (laughs) Yeah, no, not a big fan of the bush beer. Nor am I, and that's why we only did it once. (laughs) How you doing today, Stu? Pretty good, how are you? You know I can't complain. Another day in paradise in sunny Kearney, New Jersey. Stu, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about White Plume Mountain. One of my favorite mods of all time. (laughs) I'm honestly shocked it took us this long to get here. You know, we periodically pull something off the shelf and talk about it. I'm just like, wow, why didn't we do this earlier? Yeah, like two years ago. Either way, I am so excited to talk about White Plume Mountain today. So... Module S2, which the S stands for special, following Tomb of Horrors, came out in 1979. Interestingly, I just want to put this out up front. Out of all four of the special modules, this is the only one that doesn't have like its own little discrete art book. Really? Yeah, they just loaded the module up with like a whole bunch of really big art. But this one does not have the art book. And that's a little bit of sad for me because I feel like... In that way, they sort of did White Plume Mountain dirty, because I think it's my second favorite of the S series. I wholeheartedly agree with you, because it is my first favorite of the S series module, so, God, I wish they had that. I love Barrier Peaks. It's so weird. And I really wish that White Plume Mountain had gotten that treatment. Anyway, I, I don't know if you know this, but your experience playing it might inform, you know, what I'm about to tell you. So... It was not really written for publication. It was written by Lawrence Schick, and it was basically he took a whole bunch of different dungeons from his home campaign and smushed them all together and just sort of sent it to TSR to try and get a job. It was like a portfolio piece. (laughs) And then they were just like, oh, this is great. Let's print it. That makes total sense. (laughs) Oh, my God. It feels so slapdash in the moment. Yeah. And now it completely makes sense. Because it is slapdash in the moment. When you know that, you can kind of look through the module and see all of the seams. And it was something that I kind of felt earlier. It's a crazy dungeon. It's a very funhouse method of dungeon where it's a series of interconnected rooms that don't really make any kind of sense in you know, a realistic way. Like No one would build the complex that's inside White Plume Mountain because it's silly. You can't live there. I think Funhouse is a great way to describe it because it does feel so varied and it changes almost on a dime as you're playing through it. Yeah, like there's no consistency between the rooms. And that's cool because it really puts you on your heels as a player because you really don't know what's behind the door. And this sort of follows through from the philosophy that we saw in Tomb of Horrors where it's, you know, Tomb of Horrors is like the big player killing dungeon where it's just like, oh, you think you're clever? Well... I'm going to design this dungeon to be as unfair as possible, and you have to be, you know, as smart and clever as possible to get through it. This is less punishing, of course, than Tomb of Horrors, but it still has that kind of vibe. I mean, it's just as deadly. Yeah. But you do have even odds to make it through alive. Like, it's not that it was designed to specifically kill you, but boy, howdy, does it have a lot of ways to kill you. Yeah, it is a puzzle dungeon, but like it lacks those sort of gotcha traps that I feel define Tomb of Horrors. Like my problem with Tomb of Horrors always comes down to the fact that like I don't like it when a player can just do something and die. And not something stupid, like, oh, I'm gonna pry the gem out of that idol's eye. Never a good idea. I'm gonna walk down the corridor and <laughs> You know, or I'm going to stick my hand in here and see if there's something in it. Oh, uh, that that was a void. Now your hand is just gone. Like stuff like that I just think is cheap. Like I like it when there's a little bit of telegraphing, you know, so you know that you're doing something stupid and that there's a risk. I don't like it when the is completely hidden. And I think that White Plume Mountain does a better job of sort of signposting its weird, terrible traps. You know when you're going to die or risk death. I agree with you. And I do think that there is a better risk reward ratio in something like White Plume Mountain. And to me, that is more in line with 
my own dungeon master stylings where it's like, hey, this could end very badly for you, but you could let the dice decide because I'd rather players always have the option and the agency to do something like that versus like, oh, you farted briskly and it killed you. Yeah. No save. So the story, if you could call it a story, is that the evil wizard Karaptus retreated to White Plume Mountain as his like sorcerer's playground slash laboratory slash stronghold like 1500 years ago. And the world forgot about him until like a couple weeks ago, somebody makes off with these three weapons. There's a trident named Wave, a warhammer named Whelm, and of course, the sword Black Razor, which is obviously Stormbringer from the Elric stories. Oh, I know. It's so cool. I know, I know, I know. It's so exciting. <laughs> and this goes back to the slapdashedness of it. If Schick knew that it was going to be published, he never would have used such an obvious ripoff. And uh, I interviewed him once for something that never got published, and he's echoed it elsewhere that he's sort of eternally embarrassed that Black Racer is in print because it's such an obvious, you know, rip. And not the only overpowered prize in the game. Like, you didn't get one. You didn't yeah. get two. You got three of the most OP weapons in RPG history in one module. Yeah, they're ridiculous. Black Racer runs like Stormbringer, so it's a soul leader. But, like, the Trident like dehydrates people <laughs> so like they turn to like dust and whelm is kind of like the wimp of the bunch it acts as a hammer of stunning once per day when struck out of the ground it will send forth a shockwave stunning up to 45 hit points of enemies up to a distance of 60 feet yeah so it's like the off-brand hammer of thunderbolts <laughs> yeah i mean like come on you know like these are all weapons that a module should lead to or a series of modules should lead to one not like, oh, part one. Yeah, and they're kind of just laying around. Yeah, just waiting for like some dumb adventure to pick them <laughs> up and like, oh, now I have this. Yeah, well, I mean, it also makes sense because Karaptus steals these weapons from folks who are living in Greyhawk and the owners are just like, well, no, those are ours. So they put together expeditions of adventurers to try and get it back. And this is all Karaptus' plan. He basically wants people to come into his funhouse and entertain him. And at the end of the adventure, if you try and leave with one of the weapons, he kind of spills the beans and he's just like i'm not gonna let you leave that easy like i want one last excellent combat before you leave and it's just, you know it's it's just such like a like a mustache twirling james bond villain kind of setup and i'm fully here for that because you know i love a good mustache twirling villain and, and you got like such good art all of the heavy hitters are in here it's willingham jeff d the overland map that shows you White Blue Mountain and its environs is Errol Otis, and it's so good, really channeling those Marvel Conan comics. Rosloff is in here. It's a crazy amount of good art. It's an absolute classic all the way through, even though I would really want to play it or run it at this point in my life. Yeah, I mean, it's an all-star squad of D&D &D artists back in the day, and it's bright orange, too. The color is just bright orange. Yeah, I love the D&D &D orange era. Oh, it's perfect in every way. You know, I agree with you. I don't know that I'd want to run it or play it now. I think that it was a certain time and place when I did it. I played it at the very beginning of 5th edition. A buddy of mine ran it very beginning of 5th edition. And it was an unmitigated disaster in all the best ways. <laughs> a comedy of errors in the best possible way you could have it go wrong in Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, that's how it constantly happened in this game. It was the first time that I had ever experienced as a player a near party wipe. <laughs> and the reason why we didn't fully wipe is like one of the guys had a ring of regeneration on and that's it. <laughs> and one of the guys had enough hit points as the tank that he was able to drag the body of the person with the ring of regeneration out of the boiling hot water. And I'll just tell you the story real quick. It was, for all intents and purposes, the most catastrophic failure from a fireball in the history <laughs> of Dungeons and Dragons. There is a room in White Plume Mountain that is essentially, imagine being in SeaWorld. <laughs> you know, I'm going to stop you right there because I was going to ask you what your favorite room was. And this is my favorite room. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. It's a room where the walls are made of almost a gelatinous type material. And with it, the walls are very, 
very flimsy and it's holding all this boiling hot water back. It's not like it's holding back regular water or it's like, you know, a funny video where someone runs into like a swimming pool the wrong way and it bends it down. And we're talking an above ground pool here, folks, when all the water kind of splashes out onto the ground and everyone laughs because it's silly. No, no, no. This was the most boiling hot water that there could possibly be. In the middle of the room, this giant crab. Now, I mean, there was like six of us in the party. We could have taken the crab. However, the spellcaster at the time somehow got the highest initiative, and he walks in, and he sees the crab, and he just says, Fireball. And folks, that's all she wrote. <laughs> Fireball goes off in the room. The walls explode. Sure, we killed the crab with this boiling hot water. It was more of like a soft shell crab. It probably would have been delicious with some butter and garlic. <laughs> But how do you serve a delicious soft shell crab with a bunch of charred human flesh? Because the water just flushed out of the room. We're in like a five by five, maybe five by 10 hallway. One by one, the water blasts through all of us. The tank is near the end. He kind of gets up the stairs. The guy who had the ring of regeneration on, he just dies, but starts to regenerate slowly. So the tank pulls him out, burns his hand, drags him up the stairs. The rest of us are deader than disco at this point. And I mean, she's... This has got to be like, what, six, seven, eight years ago at this point? Maybe more? I don't know. All I know is that was the end of the adventure for most of the party in White Plume Mountain. And of course, the rest of the adventurers who barely survived happened to find some other adventurers who had been wandering around. And we <laughs> teamed up and we finished the module together, but not for lack of having to do it once or twice to make it stick. Yeah. Like, that's sort of the beauty of it. I think that there's something to be said for the beauty of failure in early Dungeons & Dragons. I feel like we've gotten away from that sort of culturally. We like to succeed, and we like to push stories forward, and narrative has become more important. But I feel like for White Plume Mountain and modules like it, the idea is to fail spectacularly and survive by the skin of your teeth, just enough to finish the module. (laughs) If we open this up to listeners and ask them to send us your White Plume Mountain stories, we'll get a bunch of doozies. Oh, I'll bet. And I bet they're all spectacular failures in all the best ways. And I love the fact that White Plume Mountain sort of more so than Tomb of Horrors, and definitely, I think, more so than Barrier Peaks, is that you can kind of have cascading failures because the space is so confusing. Like, there's not necessarily like a good exit strategy to safety. (laughs) Whereas like once you've kind of tripped the traps in Tomb of Horrors, like everything behind you is relatively safe. I feel like you could get into a lot of trouble retreating in White Plume Mountain, which just adds to the fun. Absolutely. And that's the kind of thing where you often wonder, well, how did this creature get into the dungeon? You could easily find out the hard way by trying to go backwards. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess fun isn't the right word so much as I think carnage. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. Yeah, the Errol Otis illustration of the giant crab is one of my favorites. I also really love the terraced room that has all the tanks oh, and the manticores. Yeah. Amazing. Just like what a ridiculous room, like an absolutely ridiculous room. You know, on the bottom of the terrace, it's got like four or five levels of this terrace. And you walk in and there's, you know, a smallish room with a couple manticores in it. And then the next level is like these aquarium tanks. <laughs> and it goes all the way around the room and it's the dragonfish or the sea lions or whatever. <sighs> and then there's another tier where it's a bunch of scorpions. And then the final tier has, weirdly enough, a live giant crayfish. And the manticores are wing clipped. And you know my thing with manticores. You do love a manticore. I love a manticore, but I hate manticores with wings. So if you're going to put manticores in an adventure and you're going to clip their wings, why have wings at all? Just leave the wings off. They don't have wings. Manticores don't have wings, folks. And that's your hot take for the day. (laughs) Well, one thing I do want the listeners to really grasp here is now that you have mentioned at the top of the episode that this was a portfolio piece, it really does make sense because every one of these crazy rooms is like a person who is trying to find a job, I'm going to show you all my best stuff, but instead of giving you a full dungeon that leads up to like this big finish room, which is like the big finish of the dungeon, you get them sporadically put out through the adventure. So there is, for all intents and purposes, multiple boss fights in the game, and they're all serious, and they're all very much like bigger than the next, but it doesn't really essentially build up to a big finish at the end. You're just kind of like... 
wow, I almost died there. That was pretty intense. And now I kind of have to do it again, but a different way. So it becomes kind of like a, a seven layer dip of hell, if you will. <laughs> And there's no big bad. I mean, you never really encounter Karaptis, if I'm remembering it correctly. You don't have that face-off. The idea is get the weapons and get out. And he's just a presence kind of watching, like Arcade in the X-Men, you know? Exactly. And like Arcade in the X-Men, it's just not as deadly. It's designed to really push the party to the limits. And by the end, you should be like, you know, all bandages limping out. But I feel like you stand a pretty good chance of surviving as long as you don't have that wizard with the fireball spell white plume mountain really is a sadist playground <laughs> but it's really just meant to kind of slap you around a little bit and see how you react and kind of let you leave and hope you come back again it really is to the detriment of the players to not be smart while you're in this dungeon because you are more likely to get yourself killed than the dungeon will yeah totally i think that you've nailed it there the dungeon isn't going to kill you. You are going to kill you. And I think that's a strong distinction from Tomb of Horrors and a lot of other dungeons of this period. And White Plume Mountain is like one of the most famous. I think it's generally regarded as one of the best modules ever written, which I think is also really amusing considering it was like a slapdash portfolio piece. Like <laughs> he managed to make some magic with it. It certainly is beloved more than I think it is actually good. However, I think that's not a bad thing. I don't think you could do it. I think that it's very much a moment in time. And it is sort of like lovable because of its derivativeness, you know? And it has a, like a nice little bit of a tale of a legacy, you know? In second edition, they did a return to White Plume Mountain, which introduced Frost Razor because you needed another one. Of course. <laughs> what more magic items? And it, it also got reprinted in uh, Tales from the Yawning Portal, right? For fifth edition. It got like an official fifth edition port. And I think that's cool. If there's one adventure from back then that I think should continue to have like easy accessibility to its weirdness, I'm okay with it being White Plume Mountain. Right on, Stu. Do you have any final thoughts on White Plume Mountain? Not quite about White Plume Mountain, but I do want to point out that Lawrence Schick is a really interesting dude. And when I interviewed him, he was working as a lore master over at Elder Scrolls Online. So he was working with Zeb Cook there. I think that's really interesting. And then I recently found out that he is like a huge Alexandre Dumas nerd and has been making new translations and sort of like correcting all of the Three Musketeers novels bit by bit. So he's like an Alexandre Dumas scholar and French translator. And I think that that's like awesome. If you've ever seen a picture of Lawrence Schick, especially in like the early 2000s, he's got very luscious long hair that looks very much like a musketeer's hair. And I feel like him translating musketeer novels is just the perfect thing for him to be doing. That is awesome. Yeah. So check those out. They're supposed to be very, very good. All right, folks. This was another amazing episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. Stu, where can the people find you? They can find me every day on Instagram. Every day at Vintage RPG, posting things about White Plume Mountain, Dungeons & Dragons modules, role-playing games of all sorts. I don't really post too much, if at all, about Three Musketeers novels, so you're just going to have to go buy those yourself. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Folks, you could find me on the Twitter at Handbreaker. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about board games. I tweet about RPGs. You could also find my day-to-day -day adventures in podcasting and in life over on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire. If you want more of the Vintage RPG Podcast, think about becoming one of our patrons. We've got a lot of cool extra stuff going on over at patreon.com slash vintage RPG. And if you're in the mood for something cool to wear this summer, we've got some great merch over at vintagerpg.com slash merch, including hats, t-shirts, hoodies, and mugs. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. Your reviews do help other listeners to find us. Thank you once again for listening to the Vintage RPG Podcast. And for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. It's kind of weird that there's never been a Three Musketeers role-playing game, right? I feel like that's kind of a grave omission at this point. Yeah. Huh. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 